Vince, are you ready for rapid fire? Yes, let's do it. Let's rapid go. Fire me. Let's go. All right. Fill in the blank. Notre Dame cornerback <clears throat> Clarence Lewis announcing he's entering the portal after six spring practices is blank. <sighs> disappointing. It's disappointing. And I'm and I'm not saying it's disappointing because I was anticipating him be a starter or anything like that. But he's a guy, obviously, he's been with the program for five years. He's a guy that knows the defense. He knows the university. He knows the program. He's a guy you need in that room as a leader because, you know, that room is not very old, to be honest with you. If you're talking the entire secondary, that room is not very old. If you're talking about just the corners, it's really not very old. Okay, so having him around and being a ready-to-go backup, a second-string guy who can come in if there's an injury, not going to be a bunch of drop off. You know, you know, he's going to be in the right place at the right time. You know, that kind of a thing. He's just, he's limited athletically, which is why he's not a starter, <clears throat> but it is disappointing. I'm sure he wants to go start someplace. I'm sure that that's obviously what it is. He sees the writing on the wall. Okay, fine. But from a depth standpoint, it's disappointing I mean, uh, and as like, a Notre Dame fan. It, and, and that's great if you want to go start someplace, but why didn't you just enter the portal in January and move on and do your thing or either that or, you know, I, I, I guess it's better off for both you and well, not even you because you know, not you, him for Clarence Lewis. I, I was going to say it's better off for, for him and the team to do it. Now I, it's better off for the team because now they get to see a lot more players because if he had waited until the end of spring and then done it, it's like, sure. well, you know, he was getting all these reps that could be going, to somebody else. So from that aspect, I think it's you're better off as a team right now, but there is a lot of youth and inexperience and the timing of the whole thing, doing it like you would have thought that after the Benjamin Benjamin Morrison injury, that this opens a door for Clarence Lewis yeah. for possibilities for more opportunities because whatever uncertainty is going to be there with Benjamin Morris Morrison and you know, in terms of his return. But you know, this is a guy who obviously has a lot of experience. He's played in like 50 games over the last four years, you know, came up big yeah. his freshman year against Clemson in 2020 and the win over Clemson and, and all that stuff. He was a bit of a luxury. Never, he, you know, never really took that next step, though. Kind of always yeah, that's fair. stayed in that mid-range and some of these younger guys passed him up. So I don't begrudge him for wanting to going, you know, wanting to go and have an opportunity somewhere, but it just seems very odd that he would kind of waste his time and everyone else's time by doing it six, you know, six practices into the spring. Yeah. It seems very odd time to do it. You're right. The timing is very odd. It, something must've happened. That That's the only way I can look at it. Something must've happened behind the scenes <clears throat> where he didn't climb the depth chart. Like he thought maybe after the injury or sure, you know, something must have just made it super clear that he wasn't going to get what he wanted. You know what I mean? And he's like, well, might as well do it now. And since he's a graduate, he can do it. He doesn't have to wait for the window to open. And so that gives him an opportunity to get a head start on the window, uh, the portal window, right? Because uh, that doesn't even open until April, in the middle of April, I think. And so maybe he looks at it as well. I better do it now, get a head start on this thing, because it's pretty clear I'm not going to be the guy here. Yeah, I don't know. Tommy's saying he got passed by a younger guy. Look, it's spring. Like, are we going to base, you know, spring depth? You know, look at the offensive line that Notre Dame had last year and some other spots as well. The depth charts were far from set by the sixth practice of spring. So if you're going to let getting past, you know, he'd already been passed by younger guys. Well, yeah, because he wasn't starting matter. last year. Virtually I mean, everyone out there yeah. was younger than him to begin with. Right. So for the last couple of years. By yeah. The way. With the exception of Cam Hart, right. everyone else was younger than him. Yeah. So yep. I don't know. Fill in the blank. Notre Dame men's basketball player Kerry Booth entering the portal today is blank. Surprising again, uh, because it felt like, you know, he started, I think, the last nine or ten games of the season. It felt like he was going to be part of the foundation of what, you know, Micah Shrewsbury wanted to do moving forward. He he committed to Penn State when Micah was there. As soon as Micah came to Notre Dame, Kerry Booth followed. And so you figure, you know, he's a Micah Shrewsbury guy. Um, I, I think that it's a it's it's interesting timing i will say that 
His announcement is interesting because it says all options are on the table, including coming including back to Notre return. Dame. Yeah. What what that says to me, this is my opinion only. My only my opinion. Sounds like he's where's where where's the money going to be, baby? If Notre Dame can step up to the plate, give me some coin, I'll stick around. I mean, Maybe I can find some greener pastures. There's upside in Kerry Booth's game, but this is also a guy who averaged six and a half points yeah. and four and a half rebounds. And had one know, big little, game against Virginia. Yeah, you know, he had yeah. some nice games. There's a lot of upside. I'm not trying to knock him, but I mean, is he really going to get that much NIL money out there? Like, is somebody going to dangle that much? It just feels like if you stick around at Notre Dame and you perform at Notre Dame, you're going to have a chance to make some of that here. Absolutely. It just seems, it just seems, you know, again, like, I don't know. I, I think this is just the world we live in though. You finish your freshman year. You see what else you're a solid there. contributor. Yeah. Like Stymie. I saw the, you know, the comment that Stymie had, he was hoping, you know, that this young core was going to stick around and grow together. And that's, that's what's most disappointing about this whole thing because he's the freshman and there's a ton of upside that I think you can see in Kerry Booth and the way he played down the stretch showed sure. that upside and that's what's most disappointing about it be, you know because of all that because i think that we all kind of thought that well this is a guy who's going to be around and and help turn this program around but as it turns out there's just one more spot potentially that micah shrewsbury has to go out and fill with someone from the portal himself now yeah well and father david makes a good point he's like you know there was a couple of times where micah shrewsbury went off in a post-game press conference about effort and all that was carrie booth one of those guys you know what I mean? Like we don't and know do. everything, yeah. you know, we don't know everything that happened behind closed doors. Maybe that relationship is a little strained, you know, because of that. And look, Michael Shrewsbury made it very obvious and very but, clear. If you don't want to be that guy, we'll find a place for you. And I mean, and this is a guy who comes from an NBA family. His dad, sure. Calvin, is the general manager of the Denver Nuggets. So you're, you're exactly right. You know, like what some of those expectations slash entitlements or whatever might be we don't know exactly how any of that look but i think maybe you can factor some of that stuff in there and, and since we're bringing up nil i'm sure people are starting to twitch and they're getting worried that marcus burton is going to leave for you know nil money i can tell you through some sources that he did sign an nil nil deal with a company uh, that is very close with notre dame so don't see him going anywhere anytime soon due to that so uh, i think we're going to see marcus burton in a notre dame uniform for a while yeah, from what I understand, with, with you know, when the the basketball seasons were winding down, there were a lot of different internal conversations yep. <clears throat> over there about, okay, this person's going to need this much nil money. Sure. This person's going to need this for for both programs, basically. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of this kind of stuff that's that's going on, and it's only going to become more prominent. Oh yeah. Year. So maybe yep. you know, like if nil. Was a huge factor for Kerry Booth. Maybe he ended up not getting nearly as much as he thought he was. That's supposed possible. To. And, it's definitely you know, possible. And as you said, maybe that's why he's leaving open the door that if he doesn't get right greener pastures someplace else, that he's like, oh, well, I'll just come back and take this and right. see what happens. I just don't know that the market's going to be that big. I, I just, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. I just think he's a he's a project, and I don't know if many schools are looking for projects right now. At least not paying him a bunch of NIL money. I concur. It'd be one thing if he averaged, you know, even 10 points and say seven rebounds or something sure. like that. As Itching a freshman close to a double, in the double. ACC. Yeah. Right. Or even, you know, closer to 10 rebounds, even if the points weren't, you know, something like that where he really stood out as a freshman in the ACC. He was a solid young player in the ACC. Sure. But not not someone that that I think a lot of programs are going to say, man, I got to bank, I got to bank myself yeah. on that. I think it's a lot of programs be like, oh, not you know right what, he, he'd be nice to have as a depth piece. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But it's not going to be a blank check to get him to come over. You know what I mean? So uh, I guess it just depends on how deep the NIL pockets are, whatever school he would be interested in. But I just don't see the market being that massive. I just don't. Yeah. Joe saying, do you think future deals with companies will include NIL deals? I, I'm assuming you're talking about like corporate Notre sponsorships Dame. and stuff yeah. like that. And yeah, I mean, like I'm sure they know, do. Under yeah. Armour, there's there's NIL stuff. Like Dick Sporting Goods is one of the, yep. the team Notre Dame sponsors this year. And Andrek Estime, you might remember, did something with Dick Sporting Goods. I think it was back before, like 
around the time training camp was getting ready to start. He did an like an NIL type appearance out there with Dick. So I think I think that absolutely pretty much all, you know any of these companies who are getting involved being you know corporate partners with Notre Dame, there is going to be some kind of NIL component involved with that. Well, and there was always, even back in the day before NIL was a thing, when companies would sign on with Notre Dame to be sponsors, they would have internships and they would have, you know, opportunities from the academic side, you know, for, for student athletes to be a part of that company and things like that. So it only makes sense that NIL would also be a part of that as well. Now, Salty saying Hidalgo has a huge NIL opportunity with companies that sell nose rings. I don't know if you saw, but this weekend there was a local jewelry um, seller. Hannah, like, do you remember the uh, Hidalgo's hoops that they were using? Oh, yeah. The promotional thing. There's a local jeweler that is going to start selling Hannah Hidalgo's gold hoop earrings. So, I would think that nose rings seem to make a you know a good uh, good companion with the uh, hoop ear rings as well. Like I would capitalize on that as much as I can if I'm Hannah. One hundred percent. Make the best of a bad situation. One hundred percent. Absolutely. Yep. Fill in the blank. There was more controversy at the women's elite eight yesterday in Portland when the head coaches of Texas and North Carolina State discovered the three point lines at the opposite ends of the floor. We're not the same distance. And that is blank. Embarrassing is what that is. That's embarrassing. You know, you can't even, you know, we always make fun, not make fun of, but we always reference like Hoosiers, you know, and they they, they walk in measure. and they, they, they yeah. drop the measure. It's 10 feet, just like our gym, you know, whatever. Guess not. <laughs> I guess it's not the same. Like, I, come on, man. Like, this is simple <laughs> measurement and math. So, How are we messing this up? Update on this today. Apparently, the company that makes these courts is Connor Sports. And they went back and did an inspection of the court to try to figure out what happened. They found out there's like a center hole punch that they put at a certain spot. And from there, you know, they do like the radius sure. of the three-point line. Apparently, at the one end of the court, that center hole was punched nine inches off. And so it caused the three-point line. That's almost a foot. That's a lot. And they played four games on that court before anyone noticed it. Wow. Like, how did – as soon as they started talking about this on TV and they showed the court yesterday, it's it was obvious oh, yeah. that one three-point line was – much you know there was it, it was it was farther away than the other one and it turned out it was nine inches off so that's, that's even more embarrassing sean i I'm know sorry nine inches is a lot that's a that's embarrassing that look that just it, is embarrassing and it's like you know the the texas coach said afterwards that he you know was hearing from from colleagues across the sport saying you know basically only in women's basketball could something like this happen and Remember, it was just a few years ago when they were playing the tournament in the bubble down there in San Antonio that all the controversy arose from the gyms. The, the, yeah, the difference in the yeah. facilities, the men's versus the women's. It's like you got one job. Can you just can you can you make the court right? It, I mean, it's it doesn't not that seem hard. like it could be that hard. That's literally their job is to make courts. Yeah, and then you know, like the whole you know measure twice, cut once thing, like. It, it feels like after you complete it, I guess, if you know, if you're going to go that far, you would be doing all the measurements to make sure that everything's right. And you haven't screwed something up before you send them off again right. to like Sweet 16 Elite Eight sites. Pretty important, pretty important pieces of equipment that you're working well, on. And like the inside, the three point line and outside the three point line, like inside is stained. You know what I mean? And as, right. <clears throat> as you're sitting there staining it by hand. You don't notice like this much difference, <laughs> right? And how much more like like area that you have to paint? Like, I, how did this slip through so many people? Then it was never caught, and the well, fact that like, they played four games on it. That's why I can't believe like you know all these warm ups and coaches yeah. and everything else, players shooting like no one noticed nine nine inches is a huge difference from one end of the floor to the other. I can't believe that no one you know because again. All you had to do was see like the side shot of that yes. floor, and it, yes. it was obvious very quickly. 
how big a difference there was. I can't believe nobody noticed that through all those games. I know. A day of practice, the first, you know, the whole thing. Seriously. Very odd. I was waiting to see who would have the uh, inappropriate comment. Stymie wins the battle on that one. Oh, boy. I mean, you knew it was coming. (laughs) So, Caitlin Clark (laughs) leads Iowa against Angel Reese and LSU in in an Elite Eight rematch of last year's Women's National Championship game. Tonight, last year's title game, the most watched women's game ever, had an average of 9.9 million viewers. At its peak, it was over 10 million. How close to that number do you think tonight's game will get? I think it'll get really close. I really do. I think this is the first real test for Iowa. I think that with all the controversy that LSU brings to the table with their coach and with their players, and then you added Haley Van Lift to the roster, and she's a whatever. Um, I, I just, it's a good way to put it. Yeah. It is a whatever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, LSU is an easy team to dislike. I'll, I'll just put it that way. And, um, you know, I, I've got a bunch of coworkers at school who texted me how about how excited they are to watch the game tonight. And they don't watch a whole lot of women's basketball, obviously. And they're like fired up to watch this game tonight. And so I think they're going to get darn close to it. I, and I think the national championship game might be a letdown. Uh, if that's the case, I really do. Well, especially if Iowa loses tonight. Well, we'll talk about that in a second. I think tonight, I think it's got to get somewhere at least 8 million. I think yeah. it's got to be around that that number. Yeah. You know, I'm going to tune in. It a little bit that it's a Monday night and not a Sunday night, but if fair, you know, I think that they were kind of saving this because now, you know, you've got Iowa, LSU, and then you've got UConn, USC. And obviously, USC isn't as big a name. But you've got Juju Watkins and all that sure. with USC. You know, another first-team All-American going up against Paige Beckers. And, you you know, so you've got, you, you, you know, definitely the early game is the one to watch, the 7 o'clock game. Oh, which yeah. Which is actually just getting ready to get started here right now, Iowa and LSU. I think it's going to – I think it's got to get somewhere around $8 million. I would be shocked if it doesn't get – that yeah this is going to be a big one There's but the no follow-up then if lsu wins do you buy or sell that you know tonight's game getting higher ratings than any of the final four games next weekend if lsu beats iowa tonight do you think tonight's game is going to be higher viewed than any of next weekend's final four games 100 percent. there's no doubt in my mind because as much as people hate lsu they love caitlin clark more and so caitlin clark needs to be in this tournament to get the ratings. It absolutely needs to happen. I think so too. So they yeah. lose, it's over. Again, like you've got, you know, like I guess LSU is still a little bit of a draw because of all the recent Kim Mulkey controversy and all that stuff. And I'm, you know, it's like the Washington Post should be sending her gift certificates to nuts.com for all the attention, you know, that that she helped draw to that story that you know, was probably barely going to be read. Because all you they know, care about is clicks. Any, yeah. They, exactly they don't care right. about anything else. Come that's, on I now. Mean, all anyone, you know, as soon as the story dropped, all anyone wanted to see was, okay, is this as bad as Kim Mulkey said it was going to be? And then it was nothing. Turned out to be the LA Times that had the the crazy story. Hilarious. But yeah. You know, so you've, so you've at least got that and Angel Reese and, you know, Flo J and all that kind of stuff. But like South Carolina, for whatever reason, for as successful as they've been, they still don't sort of move the knee. I guess it's because sure. they don't have enough crazy over there. You well, know, maybe that's it, you know, but they don't move the needle the same. You know, again, Juju Watkins, UConn, you know, UConn. I think I think everyone kind of seems to be like past UConn at this point. But they're just, you know. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, you're probably right. They probably are. They haven't been as dominating as they had been in the past. You know yeah. what I mean? And I think tonight will be the highest rated game of the year. And you yes. know, if and then if <laughs> Iowa loses, I don't think next weekend's games have a chance. What everyone, you know, wants to see is potentially a, another Iowa South Carolina matchup. Hundred so, percent. Yep. All right, men's side. It's UConn against Alabama, Purdue against NC State in the final four. How many of those teams did you predict, Vince? Ooh, man. Uh, some, let me see. I got my bracket right here. Let's see here. Where is my bracket? There we go. So final four, I had <clears throat> UConn and Purdue. So I had 50%. 
All right. 50%. So not John too said he had 50%. I had UConn. That was it. I had Purdue going out. Didn't have NC State in any world. You know, and this NC State team is basically trying to pull off the same Cinderella that Jim Jimmy V and, yeah. and that Wolfpack crew pulled off the last time they were in the Final Four. That's the last time they were there, 1983, which is amazing. DJ Burns, man, he's getting NFL interest apparently right now. 6'9", wow. 275. That Apparently, big boy? Yeah, guys want to I saw him live at Notre Dame, and I was like, that is an offensive tackle, not yes. a basketball player. Yep. But watching him go up against Zach Eady is going to be must-see TV, in my opinion. It's going to be fun. Yeah, that's gonna, You want to talk about contrasting styles? Yep. You just found it. I think that's going to be fun to watch. I tell you what, man, that 30 to nothing run in that UConn-Illinois game was Oof. just insane. Woof. It's like... <clears throat> Brad Underwood, adjust. He he will just he, he just went down with the ship, man. man. He's like, this is what we do. We're gonna keep doing it. And Donovan Klingon was like, get it out of here. Man. Rejected back into the stands. Somehow they only credited him with five blocks. It seemed like he had a million. Man. He was just <laughs> everything, everything, just rejection, rejection. Seven yeah. foot two. I had the, I, in Connecticut too. Yeah, I had the other two tobacco road teams. I had. Uh... UNC and Duke in my final four. So they almost made it, but they did not. So yeah. that'll be uh that'll be a fun little fun little matchup, like you said. Burns against Zach Eady in that NC State Purdue game. Looking forward yes. to seeing that. Yes. I where are you in our uh our bracket challenge? Oh, I have no chance. I don't know. I just <laughs> I stopped I stopped looking at it a long time ago. <laughs> okay. I'm probably like in 80th place. <laughs> I, I'm in 17th place. I, I'm still in the neighborhood. You've done pretty well. Still yeah, UConn is UConn is the only team that I had getting to the Final Four. I had Houston okay. winning it all, so okay. I have no chance at winning anything. <laughs> no chance. So, nope. All right, well, that's going to do it for tonight. Going to go watch some basketball now, and, of course, we will be back tomorrow as always. So appreciate you being here. Hit the like button before you leave, and, of course, Make sure you're listening on Apple yeah. if you are an Apple podcast subscriber. It is much appreciated, as always. We will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Ivy Nation Sports Talk.